The following program is sponsored by CBN. Coming up, learn how the Warriors from West Point prepare for battle and hear how it can help you win the fights in your own life. Plus, I start craving something stronger to numb the pain. That's something cocaine. It became my friend. And that wasn't his only mistake. Don't get high off your own supply. One addict's final hit. I felt that if I died in that state, I knew I would go to hell. On today's 700 Club. Welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Well, the battle over the Mueller report uh, is just beginning. Democrats say the findings are rigged. <laughs> And they're suggesting Attorney General William Barr is partisan. They're demanding the full release of the report by next week. And interesting, on that report, the president is agreeing with them. Our CBN Capitol Hill correspondent, Abigail Robertson, has that story. Republicans are claiming the high road after the 22-month Mueller investigation found no collusion between the Trump campaign and Russia. It's lasted a long time. We're glad it's over. It's 100% uh, the way it should have been. I wish it could have gone a lot sooner, a lot quicker. Make no mistake about it, my fellow Americans, this was a total vindication of the President of the United States and our campaign. And it should be welcomed by every American. Democrats disagree questioning the attorney general's conclusions. The president has not been exonerated by the special counsel, yet the attorney general has decided not to go further or apparently to share those findings with the public. Suggesting the findings are rigged and calling for the release of the full report to the American public. We cannot simply rely on what may be a hasty, partisan interpretation of the facts. President Trump and other Republican leaders agree the report should be released. Up to the Attorney General, but it wouldn't bother me at all. My desire is for the public to get as much of the report as possible. Senate Judiciary Chairman Lindsey Graham is calling for a special counsel to look into actions by the FBI and Department of Justice during the investigation into the Trump campaign in 2016. What makes no sense to me is that all the abuse by the Department of Justice and the FBI, the unprofessional conduct, the shady behavior, nobody seems to think that's much important. Well, uh, that's going to change, I hope. He questions why no one alerted Trump of possible ties between his associates and foreign governments like Russia, as they have for lawmakers like Senator Dianne Feinstein in the past. That's the way it's supposed to work. How did it fail and break down here? Was it a ruse? to get into the Trump campaign? I don't know, but I'm gonna to try to find out. Meanwhile, administration officials are calling on the media to apologize. You, apology. you owe the country an apology. It gets my goat that we're doing great things in that building behind you and you refuse to cover it because you had to cover collusion, you had to cover conspiracy, and you had to cover the Russians, you had to cover treason, you had to cover impeachment, you had to cover indictment, you had to cover nonsense. Senator Graham warns Democrats they should accept the findings of the Mueller investigation or risk the public backlash Republicans faced in the 90s as they continue to investigate President Bill Clinton. Reporting from Capitol Hill, Abigail Robertson, CBN News. Well, you know, the, uh, the media is just apoplectic. They were so totally wrong. They were so absolutely wrong. CNN was just off the wall and MSNBC off the wall. Some of their comments were outrageous. And you put them all together, the, the New York Post put them all together in a, in a column. It's just incredible how these people screwed up. But they, they didn't do that. It was deliberate. They wanted Trump out. They hate Trump because Trump is, is going after the establishment. The people who've controlled this government and, and all of their uh, tentacles are, are feeling the heat because he wants to get rid of them. And there's one thing that he wants to get rid of, and that's called the Afford Affordable Care Act. There's a judge in Texas who has ruled that the individual mandate is uh, unconstitutional. And therefore, if one branch of that law is unconstitutional, the whole thing is, because there was no severability built into it. 
And uh, the Trump administration has agreed with the judge. They said the Justice Department is not going to appeal it. So that's the way it is. Yeah. Well, what's happening now? <laughs> Well, Pat, uh, the Justice Department, as you were just saying Monday, reversed course to support a federal judge's decision declaring the Affordable Care Act unconstitutional. District Court Judge Reed O'Connor's ruling in December also called for the entire health care law to be invalidated. Previously, the DOJ argued that only parts of the law were unconstitutional. This move is expected to solidify health care as a top campaign issue going forward, especially in the area of pre-existing conditions. Well, the Senate is ex uh, set to vote on the Green New Deal. Introduced by freshman Democratic Congresswoman Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez, the controversial bill lists several expensive proposals including getting rid of all fossil fuels and upgrading every building in America to make them environmentally friendly. Several Democratic presidential candidates co-sponsor the bill. Critics label it as socialist. Senate Majority Leader Mitch McConnell scheduled to vote to put Democrats on the record for the election season. Democrats who don't want to be tagged as supporting the bill plan to vote present. Well, residents of southern Israel spent the night in bomb shelters as the IDF and Gaza militants exchanged fire. The situation is calm today, but there are fears the fighting will resume. As Chris Mitchell reports from the southern town of Starot, some believe Hamas is taking advantage of the upcoming Israeli elections. Israel is responding forcefully to this wanton aggression. I have a simple message to Israel's enemies. We will do whatever we must do to defend our people and defend our state. Netanyahu canceled his appearance at APAC after Hamas launched a rocket at Israel that slammed into a home north of Tel Aviv. Israel has moved two brigades to the southern border, including one armored brigade, signs it may be ready for a ground incursion. Hamas launched more than 30 rockets into Israel over two days. Many were shot down by Israel's Iron Dome. Israel struck dozens of targets inside Gaza, including the home of Ismail Haniya, head of Hamas's political bureau. Many residents here in Starod and southern communities slept in bomb shelters last night. All schools around the Gaza Strip were closed, and employees with non-essential jobs can only go to work if a bomb shelter is close by. There's nothing more nerve-wracking than at 3 in the morning, to hear a siren going off saying Tseva Adom, which means red alert. So you have basically five to ten seconds to take your babies in the middle of the night out of their room and take them to the one room in the house that's a safe room. What do you do when the alarm goes off? I'm praying. I'm praying for God that will save us. Professor Eyal Zizer said the upsurge in Hamas attacks has to do with the upcoming Israeli elections. No government will go to war before elections. So. They think they have, you know, a window of opportunity till the election to, on the one hand, escalate a little bit, a little bit, and to gain something in return. Regardless, many residents here depend on God and prayer from around the world. We appreciate the prayers of our Christian brothers and sisters. The Iron Dome is not just a physical defense shield. We need your spiritual defense shield also. We really believe that miracles are happening every single day. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Sterot, Israel, okay, the bomb shelter capital of the world. Thanks, Chris. And Pat, before he left Washington, Prime Minister Netanyahu did promise a forceful response. Well, I, I, nobody wants to go to war before an election. That's not a cool thing. But at the same time, uh, Israel has to defend itself. I think pulling out of Gaza was a terrible mistake. There were many, many Jewish people living there. Gaza could have been pacified. Uh, and yet, at the same time, it was Ariel Sharon who um, pulled them out. And actually, they forced the settlers to leave at gunpoint and leave all of their houses and their land and their gardens and all the rest of it and pull out, turn it over to the Palestinian Authority. The Palestinian Authority is under the control of Hamas. Hamas is a terrorist organization dedicated to the destruction of Israel. So that's hardly a partner in peace. and There's hardly a nice neighbor to have next to you. So now Hamas is sending rockets, and one rocket hit just the south of Tel Aviv, which is, you know, the major city there in, in Israel. And to feel that that kind of stuff's going on, 
But what are the Israelis going to do? Is it time to go back in and retake Gaza? It will, I mean, who's going to live there? It's going to be very, very hard to get settlers to go back in there again. And uh, it's going to be like a, 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 a sore uh, in, in the side of Israel. So it was a big mistake. They made a terrible mistake. Sharon made a terrible mistake, but he's gone now, and they've got to live with it. Well, there's something else that was amazing. They almost had the vote. If John McCain had voted up instead of down, the Affordable Care Act would have been done away with, and they could put something else in its place. So that's before us, and that case is there. But also, there's a problem now in Venezuela. And uh, the Trump administration is warning Russia not to meddle. So let's have that story right this moment. That's right, Pat. That cautionary warning for Russia not to meddle in Venezuela comes after reports that two planes brought about 100 Russian troops into the country. Russia backs strongman Nicolas Maduro in the standoff with interim president Juan Guaido. Some Venezuelan soldiers are fleeing the country because they can no longer support Maduro. Chuck Holton brings us their stories from the border town of Cucuta, Colombia. High stakes brinksmanship on the world stage between the United States and Venezuelan leader Nicolas Maduro's government. After U.S. aid was burned at the border by gangs loyal to Maduro, the Trump administration continued ramping up the pressure on the embattled leader to leave office, something Maduro has steadfastly refused to do. After interim President Juan Guaido's top aide was arrested by Venezuelan intelligence operatives on March 21st, Trump's national security advisor, John Bolton, fired off a tweet threatening even more sanctions ahead. Though all of the Venezuelan borders are officially closed, more than 40,000 desperate Venezuelans are escaping into Colombia every day. Most are hoping to find some kind of work in order to send help to the families they left behind. Catherine has been living here on the street with two of her children. I've been here four months working as a porter. She tries to make a living helping others carry their supplies back across the dangerous river crossing into Venezuela. But there's lots of competition. Sometimes I have to fight the other porters because everyone wants the same car, you know? The sense of frustration reached a boiling point weeks ago when gangs loyal to Maduro burned aid sent by Colombia and the United States. Catherine, along with many others, are bitter about what happened. If we go back, it won't be any better. At least here my kids can eat. Cracks are appearing in the ranks of the armed forces as well. These two soldiers threw down their arms February 23rd when they were given orders to fire on their own people. Sergeant Major Darwin Malaguera says morale in his unit was at rock bottom. February 23rd was the breaking point. When we saw what was happening, we decided we wanted to be on the right side of history, and we made the decision on our own to cross over to the Colombian side. First Sergeant Omar Carrero was on the bridge that day, watching the tragedy unfold. Many times we had talked about defecting amongst ourselves, but were very afraid one of our superiors would hear us, because if they did, we'd be thrown in prison automatically. But finally, in small groups, we made the decision to cross. On the very same day, the secret police showed up at my house, looking for my family. Thank God they weren't home. Eventually, over a thousand soldiers followed suit, including some officers. But many more are still afraid. I can say that 98% of the troops in the army would like to see a change of government. To keep his stranglehold on power, Nicolas Maduro has been arming gangs of criminals who swear allegiance to his regime. Called colectivos, these gangs currently control this border, and everyone who comes across has to pay. For the time being, these Venezuelan soldiers can only wait, hope, and pray the regime will collapse under the weight of its own evil. But they do have a message for America. Please keep supporting us, putting pressure on in every possible way. I'd like to say with military force, but I know that would result in lots of bloodshed in Venezuela. We don't have a plan. We're simply ready and willing to follow the orders of our president, Juan Guaido, every day. In Cucuta, Colombia, I'm Chuck Holton for CBN News. Pat, the question that many are left to ask is how much longer can the standoff last? Well, I think everybody's wondering the same thing. It's a humanitarian tra tragedy of great proportion. And uh, the nations don't seem to want to bring military force. But I have said it now and I say it again. 
this man has got to be taken out at the point of a gun. He's not going to go out peacefully. He's now, there, there's a possibility that they've got a couple of uh, uh, squads or maybe platoons of Russian troops coming in, which, of course, is a violation of everything we've known about our Western Hemisphere. And uh, the Russians are doing that, and they shouldn't, but that's the report. Uh, we also understand that the Cubans are backing up the forces. They're, they're not just Venezuelans. The Venezuelan troops would probably defect, but these Cubans are there and now Russians. But it's going to take military force. Ladies and gentlemen, I know it sounds difficult, but if you've got a, a gang of criminals holding uh, hostages in the middle of one of our cities, sooner or later, the police have got to go in there with force and, and take them out. It just has to be. And we need a police d department, but we can't just do it by the United States. It'll be a Yankee go home, and we can't have that. But what we do need is the OAS to come together and say, all right, here are the nations of Latin America. We've had all of this Maduro we can stand, and we believe in setting those people in Venezuela free. And I believe that the troops will defect immediately if there's a major force coming in, and Cubans and Russians are not, uh, we can have that uh, accomplished. But the Chinese are trying to oppose it. The Russians are trying to oppose it because it's to their benefit to weaken the United States by having a Venezuelan uh, chaos at our border. John? Pat, investigators are looking into why the engines on the Viking Sky cruise ship failed while crossing a stormy stretch of Norway's western coast over the weekend. 43 mile an hour winds and 26 foot waves rocked the vessel. Passengers posted videos showing the ship violently swaying with chairs and other furniture dangerously rolling from side to side. Water came bursting through that door. And they have water all over the ground. We were in our cabin and everything was sliding everything everywhere and breaking and, and crashing and we could hardly move or walk. Helicopters launched a dramatic mission to airlift the stranded passengers, bringing 450 people to dry land before the weather calmed, allowing the ship to be towed to port. 17 people were hospitalized. Just dramatic video there, Pat, and fortunately, uh, it didn't get any worse. Well, they, they should have probably had some reserve engines that weren't working. Apparently, the engines didn't function. But what a tragedy. It's supposed to be a fun uh, ship cruise a delightful cruise in, in the Baltic and look at something. I mean, wherever they were, I mean, it's incredible. Wow. Frightening, I'm sure. Well, that was off the coast of Norway, ship. wasn't it? Was that, yes. Yeah. I mean, I, I did a Baltic cruise of when I had one of those birthdays I've had along the way, and it was just delightful. We took off from, we sailed from England, then we went up the Kiel Canal, we got into the Baltic, and and then we visited various capitals and went all the way down to St. Petersburg. It was a lovely, lovely trip. Whew. But those people, my goodness, what a suffering. All right, Terry. You certainly a memory. <laughs> <laughs> well, coming up, the fight for 15, why the push for a higher minimum wage may not help America's low-income workers. It's, that's grossly overpaid for what the job that they do. I can't hire someone to answer the phones for that kind of money. It's, it would put me out of business. Hear why businesses say higher wages could lead to fewer jobs when we come back. I'd like to give you a little personal testimony. When I was a youngster, about 13 years old, I think it was, uh, I went to work uh, in the summer uh, for a cousin, a distant cousin, who had a big farm near Orange, Virginia. And uh, I was employed for the wonderful total of $15 a month. Not an hour, but a month. And I worked from like 6 in the morning until 8 or 9 o'clock at night. And I'm talking about serious work. And we, we had... Uh, uh, we worked a half a day on Saturday, and we got Sunday off. Wow. And, I, of course, I had room and board. Hard labor. That was. I mean, 15 bucks. Yeah. But I tell you, it, learned, it, it taught me something. I learned hard work. I learned the value of work. I mean, it was one of those experiences that I wouldn't trade for anything. It was a valuable part of my life. 
And uh, I'm, I'm deeply grateful because these are wonderful people. They're godly people. And I learned, I mean, I was out in the fields working you know, it, with the, the, this idea of segregation. There were none of us segregated out there. There were black people in the field and white people in the field, and I was out there. And it was so hot, you cannot believe it. I mean, we worked our heads off. We were hauling 100-pound bags of potatoes. We were uh, shocking uh, uh, grain. We were doing all kinds of work, and it was just a wonderful experience. Now they're saying the federal government has got to move in to get a minimum wage, not a $15 a month, which is what I got as a kid, $15 an hour. And that is going across the country, and supporters say it's necessary to lift millions out of poverty. A lot of people are saying not a, that's not going to work. It's going to cost jobs for entry-level people just like I was. Well, Caitlin Burke has that story. Tom Knapp has always loved cars. It was a passion of mine in high school. I went to college for it. I went to an automotive college for it. After earning his degree in automotive management, Knapp ran this shop for three years before buying it from his former boss. I worked at a dealership when I was right out of high school and did not like it. So I knew that private shop was the only way to do it. As a small business owner, Knapp knew he would face some challenges, like changing technology. You can't advertise in the newspaper, and radio ads are disgustingly expensive for a small business. So it's you got to learn how to get yourself out there other ways, and social media has been like the, the newest thing. What he didn't expect was the grand bargain, a new Massachusetts state law that went into effect January 1st and requires an increase in the minimum wage. This year, employers must pay $12 an hour, that will gradually increase over the next four years until it reaches $15 an hour. I was trying to have more employees. Um, the issue is to hire a C-level technician, you can't afford to pay them that much money. It's That's grossly overpaid for what the job that they do, oil changes and simple things like that. And same way with an office manager, I can't hire someone to answer the phones for that kind of money. It's It would put me out of business. Two jobs now likely lost and dreams of expansion put on hold. Other employers here worry it will mean layoffs or worse. Durgan Park, a Boston restaurant since 1827, when John Quincy Adams was president, closed at the beginning of the year. The owner citing the minimum wage increase as one of the main reasons. Massachusetts didn't start this trend. First came Seattle, then California, New York, Washington, D.C. And now Democrats in Congress won a national $15 minimum wage. We now have an opportunity and a responsibility to restore the value of the, of the minimum wage, lift millions of hardworking Americans out of poverty, and boost the economy of Main Street America. There's deep partisan divide on the issue. Democrats pushing for the Raise the Wage bill to move forward through Congress. Republicans calling it a radical idea from the far left. They don't know what's happening in the economy right now. They're obviously detached. We, unemployment is at its lowest level in 49 years. Wages are up. The economy is booming. Everywhere I go in my district, people are saying what we need are more skilled workers. We have 7.3 million jobs unfilled in this country. Scott says the increase would simply provide someone the basic essentials of living in the U.S. Workers should not be forced to work for poverty level wages regardless of where they live. But Representative Fox points out that only 2.3 percent of American workers make minimum wage. Minimum wage jobs are launching pads to go into other jobs that will pay a lot more. I doubt very many of us who started, who are now working, didn't start out at minimum wage. But the idea is not to stay at minimum wage all your life, but to move up. The Raise the Wage Act is expected to eventually pass the House, but will likely hit a roadblock in the Republican-held Senate. While that may stop a national minimum wage hike, employers in states like Massachusetts must grapple with the consequences. I'm hoping that the volume eventually increases and I can just just put it off for a little while longer, but honestly, it's probably more of a situation where I'll have to continue working in the business and continue doing the jobs myself. Caitlin Burke, CBN News, Boston, Massachusetts. When government begins to interfere with the marketplace, you know, the truth is there's a great shortage of skilled workers, a tremendous shortage in most skills. So people will pay up because of the market. 
And actually, any business uh, will try to reward its workers, and they'll pay what the market is demanding for that particular skill set, and it doesn't need government interference. But the thing is, for high school students, the average business just can't afford to hire some kid uh, who's a sophomore in high school at, at a $15 a, an hour. They just can't do it. And so the, the young man or woman doesn't get a chance at a job. And, you know, you, you need entry-level accountants. You need entry-level uh, well, automobile workers. You need entry-level uh, food service people and so forth. And these summer jobs have been very, very important to, to, to youngsters. And all of a sudden, the government's going to say, well, you have to pay these people 15 bucks an hour and $600 a month or something. And, and most businesses just can't afford it. So they say, well, the kid doesn't get to work. He gets to stay in, in school. But now he's lost the opportunity of a tremendous boost up in his earning capacity over the years. And uh, so Congress is really hurting people. They think it's a, it's a thing. If there is a robust labor market, which we have in America today, it doesn't need Congress to mandate anything because people will pay for those skilled workers and they'll gladly pay for them and they'll pay the important wages that are needed. I sit there, I mean, we have the organization I'm involved in, we have maybe 3,000 workers or so all together. And I, I look at those scales all the time to say, let's make sure we're paying our workers enough money that they, they're happy and, and have all, everything they need. And that's what you do. You want to look after your, your people who are your, your employees, the people who are your associates. They make the business go. And, of course, they get paid what they're supposed to as the market demands. But you know, one thing I, I used to say uh, with, with uh, IT workers you know, we were getting raided, and I said, well, what is the deal? And they said, well, the minimum wage, the wage that you're getting for this particular skill set is so much money. And we were like 2 or $3 off of that. I said, well, let's raise beyond that. I want to raid them. I don't want them raiding me. Yeah. And so, you know, really. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that, that's intelligent business. No, no, no businessman is going to have his good employees taken away from him because he's not paying enough money for them. So the government doesn't need to get into this. Bobby Scott, God bless you, you're wrong, Terry. <laughs> well, up next, a drug dealer who thought he had what it takes to evade the cops. I thought I had something that was just different, you know, than the other drug dealers. Quality that caused me to float under the radar and not get caught by police. Well, he didn't get caught, but he turned himself in. Find out why when we return. Welcome back. You're watching The 700 Club, and we're so happy to have you with us today. We really are. Well, I want to tell you about Kevin Howard. Kevin distinctly remembers the smell at his childhood home, it wasn't a sweet smell of uh, cooking uh, steaks and roasts. It was something else. Uh, it came courtesy of his mother's addiction to what was called crack cocaine. And two years later, that same burning odor filled Kevin's own home as well. It was like a living hell. I had a thirst that couldn't be quenched. I kept feeling like I couldn't catch my breath. Kevin Howard didn't plan to deal drugs for long and never expected to become an addict. But soon it was about more than money. It gave him a sense of worth. Being respected in our neighborhoods as being the man. Kevin grew up in the projects of Norfolk, Virginia, the oldest of three kids. His mom was just 14 when he was born. Despite their hard circumstances, they were close early on. She used to take me everywhere with her. My mom had a big smile. She was full of life. Um, you know, a people person. But when he was seven, his mom's behavior began to change dramatically. I remember she began to spend more time with her friends and uh, not with me. She would say things verbally 
to kind of, you know, wound me, offend me. And I noticed lack of food in the house, lack of clothing and the things that we need. This stench, this haunting smell that at the time was cocaine. Eventually, she chose the streets over her home. When she started dwelling in a way, that's what I was longing for her, just to get that, um, that nurturing, you know, that love, that acceptance from her, the closeness we had. His mom lost custody of her kids and Kevin had almost no contact with his dad. He started staying with his grandmother and spent his teen years searching for acceptance. It affected my confidence and um, a sense of self-worth and want to feel um, that I belong to someone and I belong to a purpose. I was lacking in that and I struggled with my identity. I started dating. I was looking for closeness, affection, and I uh, actually started becoming sexually active between 14 and 15. After high school graduation, Kevin planned to join the Air Force. But when he found out his girlfriend was pregnant, he wanted to be around and provide for his son. He saw an easy way to do that in his own neighborhood. Because the drug dealers, um, the money, the clothing, the cars, and things they had started becoming attractive. I thought I was smart than the drug itself. I thought I had something that was just different, you know, than the other drug dealers. Quality that caused me to float under the radar and not get caught by police. And it worked that way for years. But Kevin began to falter after a hard breakup with his son's mother. I started craving something stronger to numb the pain. As a drug dealer, you know, um, one of the sayings, don't get high off your own supply. <laughs> that smell, that cocaine, that was a stench that was so haunting to me and uh, so intimidating, it, it became my friend. Kevin overdosed several times and was in and out of jail on various drug charges. Though he attended Bible studies in jail, he always started using again when he got out. I was doing crack, cocaine, heroin, alcohol, smoking marijuana. Everything had reached its apex at this time. I felt that if I died in that state, I knew I would go to hell. With a warrant out for his arrest, Kevin stopped evading the police and turned himself in. I was willing to do whatever it takes to get free because I felt inside that I didn't have no more control. I wanted out. I wanted out of that life. Kevin was arrested and placed in a one-man cell. He remembered what a friend's grandmother said about God when he was a kid. She used to tell me, you're going to need God for yourself one day. She taught me about God, how to open up your heart and receive God and have faith. I got on my knees and uh, I just began to cry. You know, I just began to weep and to call out to God. And I asked him to save me. And I told him I was serious about living a life to serve him. I felt his peace come into the room. And it was like, I felt like I wasn't alone. I felt like I wasn't abandoned. I felt like... I had somebody come into my life and that was on my side that everything was going to be all right. Now Kevin was committed to living out his new faith and love for God. And his four-year sentence was reduced to only seven months. This time, Kevin was able to stay away from the drugs for good. I wanted a new foundation. I knew that I had to invest in a new nature that I had in Christ. And that's by feeding the Word of God engaging in his presence and learning how to give God true worship and praise. Kevin has forgiven his father and his mother who came to Christ before her death. Today, he works hard for a graphics company and likes to go on mission trips. Kevin married Costella in 2018 and they love their blended family of nine. He says without the grace of God, he wouldn't be alive today. He became my father, he became my friend. And guess what? No rejection is there, no abandonment is there because his love is fulfilling. And I'm just grateful that God has saved me and have given me another opportunity. What does the Bible say when my mother and father cast me out, the, the Lord will pick me up? You know, Kevin is like so many kids. They've, they've been neglected by their parents or they just haven't had the time with their parents, whatever it is. They feel lonely, they feel abandoned, they, they want a mother, they want a father, they want love. You know, that's what people want. They all want love. 
you know, the, the song, What the World Needs Now is Love, Sweet Love. Well, yeah, but we do need love. And people are made to be loved. They're made to be part of a family. They're made to have uh, the relationship with other people. That's what God made us for. And he reaches out and he says, I want to embrace you. I want you to be part of my family. And so if you feel lonely, you feel estranged, please know that the Lord himself says, I love you. I love you. And if you will let me come into your life, I will make you a new creature. I'll give you a new hope. And I'll give you a, a, a promise for the future because I know the plan that I have for you to do you good and not to do you harm. So Kevin learned the answer. He finally found what he was looking for. And if you've been seeking the Lord, I want you to give us a call. Somebody's here who will help you. Call upon the name of the Lord, and he is there with you. Let's see. Terry, what's next? Well, still I had the code of values that built leaders and helped America win in the battle. Pat Williams reveals the virtues of West Point when we come back. Welcome back to Washington for this CBN News Break. The Pentagon has authorized $1 billion to build 57 miles of pedestrian fencing along the U.S.-Mexico border. The money is the first set of funds used by President Donald Trump since declaring a national emergency on the southern border last month. The 18-foot-high fence will be built within the Yuma and El Paso sectors of the border. The funds will also go towards constructing and improving roads and installing lighting. Well, Michael Avenatti, the former attorney for Stormy Daniels, who once considered running for president, is now in legal trouble himself. Prosecutors in Los Angeles and New York charging him in two separate cr criminal indictments. The high-profile lawyer is accused of extortion and tax fraud. Prosecutors allege Avenatti tried to blackmail Nike for millions of dollars and that he stole money from a client and filed fake tax returns. Prosecutors are backing up their claims with wiretaps. Avenatti is out on $300,000 bail, and he says he will be vindicated. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. The list of West Point grads is long and distinguished. Men such as Eisenhower, Grant, Sherman, and Patton have all left their mark on American history. And as Pat Williams explains, a big reason why these names are famous is because of the virtues they were taught. President of the NBA's Orlando Magic and one of America's top motivational speakers believes that leaders with good character are made, not born. While speaking at West Point, he came across 12 benches, each highlighting a core virtue. In his book, Character Carved in Stone, Pat Williams shows us how these virtues can lead to success, not only on the battlefield, but in any area of life. Well, our friend Pat Williams is here with us now, and we welcome you back to the program. It's always great to have Terry, you. Terry, I'm always thrilled to be here. I'm so glad to see you. Thank you. You too. See you healthy and back with us. Your color looks good. It's great to have you here. Thank you, Terry. Thank you. Talk a little bit about those 12 core values that you saw inscribed on the, the benches at West Point. Well, Terry, first of all, they gave me a nice tour of the West Point campus when I was up there, and that's a fascinating experience. I haven't been there, but I hear it's beautiful. Yeah. You know, and we ended up in a little park called Trophy Point that looks out over the historic Hudson River. And I noticed these benches, 12 of them, which seemed unusual. But then when I examined them closer, there was a word carved into the end of the bench, the end of the stone. And the backstory was it was a class gift from the class of 1934. And these 12 words, they wanted to inspire cadets and future military leaders to live by those words and to lead by those words, because everything at West Point is built around leadership and teamwork. I mean, when you go to the campus, you are just imbued with those two words. And uh, so I thought, boy, this could be a great book. Uh, build a book around those 12 words and then find a West Point graduate who best modeled yeah. 
We those found particular several reasons. of them throughout the book. We did. I want to say, this is, imagine this, this is his 110th book. <laughs> Unbelievable. Well, you begin the book with Ulysses S. Grant, and I, I think one of the things unusual about him is because, you know, not only was he a great general, but you say he was a man of compassion. You don't normally think of someone who's been through a really bloody war as somebody who would necessarily embrace a compassionate spirit. And Terry, and, and many called him Butcher Grant. Yeah. Because in leading the Union to victory, you know, he had a lot of men that were, were killed. Nevertheless, when you study Grant closely, he was a very tender-hearted huh. man. Uh, he cared deeply about those soldiers. He had a unique marriage. I mean, he had a lovely marriage uh, filled with compassion. And, and he had great compassion for horses. Uh, just like Pat Robertson does. <laughs> yeah. But Grant was a horseman uh, at West Point. He was a, a terrific horseman, cared about those animals. And there was one experience during the war when he saw one of his soldiers on the side of the road just whipping and beating unmercifully his horse. And Grant stopped. He exploded with anger, which was unusual for him. And he just told that soldier if he ever saw him doing that again to that animal, uh, there was going to be a steep price that was going to be paid. Uh, Grant had a real heart for people and a, and a, a terrific heart for those horses. He loved them. Well, talk. let's jump forward to someone more contemporary that, that everybody's hearing about these days, Coach K. Yes. I mean, he, he almost didn't go to West Point. That's true. He grew up on the south side of Chicago. But Bobby Knight, who was then coaching at West Point, came and recruited him and convinced his parents that West Point would be the best spot for him. Well, Coach K, who is now 72 years old, would tell you that his years at West Point were absolutely the key to his whole life. Yeah. He learned, and we, we, this is where we tie Coach K in, to the word responsibility. Yeah. As a young cadet there, he learned about responsibility, and that has carried forward all the way through his coaching career. And another little footnote, Terry, we asked Coach K, we asked Mike to write the foreword, yeah. which he immediately agreed to do. We, we were so thrilled by that. He's a, he's a West Point guy, I mean, through and through. Well, you talk a, a little bit, if you will, about the fact that these are not, you're talking about the virtues of compassion and responsibility and commitment and all of that, but, but these are not innate. West Point seemed to really just burn these into the hearts of the, the people who attended there. But how does one acquire these character traits? It seems in our culture today, Pat, like so many of these are not valued anymore or maybe even thought about very much. Terry, I don't think we come into the world with character just gushing through <laughs> our bloodstream. I think it has to be, first of all, taught at home, mm -hmm. uh, parents, grandparents, and then coaches and teachers and youth workers, pastors. We need to be constantly teaching uh, the importance of honesty and integrity and responsibility and a humble spirit and a work ethic and perseverance. That all has to be taught. It also is caught. In other words, if youngsters see this being modeled at home, uh, they're gonna grow up knowing that this is what life is about and this is how we're to live our life. Uh, so to say, uh, I'm in this world now and my character is set. And one other note, uh, Terry, we never have a character mastered. I don't care well, how old you are. Truth. It's a lifelong endeavor, isn't it? it? Every day. Yeah. And, 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 and you can have a slip up, you know, late in life and it ruins everything you did up to then. So we've got to be very, very careful and, and alert yeah. to these character issues uh, because they're not burned in there forever. Yeah. I think it's a daily walk. Talk a little bit about the, the story of the 15-year-old that you closed the book with. Never attended West Point, and Wang was the name. What's, what's the value of what he learned? Well, he was a young man at Marjorie Stoneham School, and he had a lifelong dream that he wanted to go to West Point. But at age 15, he lost his life in that dreadful shooting in South Florida and he never was able to go to West Point. However, the Academy awarded him a, a West Point That's admittance, a spot. Yes. 
And that's how we close the book. And Terry, I, I, I guarantee or I make a promise that as you read that last little epilogue, if you don't you get some chill bumps yeah. or, or uh, f fear a little, a little teary, you know, you, you, you're going to because that is how we end the book. That young man didn't get to go to West Point, but in the final analysis, he did go to West Point. And uh, it, it's a sad story, but also a moving story. Well, in the final analysis, we all have an opportunity to acquire the kind of character traits that you talk about that are integrated into what West Point stands for. And that's, the book is called Character Carved in Stone. And it's a read worthy of you, worthy of your kids. It's a great gift, you know, for Easter, or even the holidays to be able to give to your kids and your those that you love. But thank you. You always bring something something thought worthy and remarkable when you come. We appreciate well, Terry, you. Terry, I'm always glad to be here. I uh, have great respect for you. I always like being around Pat Robertson, who uh, who just doesn't yield to, to life, to age. That I mean, he looks better truth. than ever. <laughs> and uh, people are gonna enjoy this book. I think there's some I real meat there too. for them to chew on. Thank you, Pat. Thanks, Terry. Awesome to have you here. Well, the book is available nationwide. Again, it's called Character Carved in Stone. Still to come on our program today, your questions and some honest answers. One viewer says, I'm a new Christian. My boyfriend and I had sex for the first time yesterday since I was saved. Will God forgive me? Pat's going to weigh in on that and more, so stay tuned. Time for your questions and some honest answers. Pat, this first one is from a viewer who says, I'm 22 years old and I recently got saved. I am still seeing my boyfriend and yesterday was the first time we were intimate since I was saved. After it all, I began to cry because I knew it was wrong and not pleasing to God. I started praying and asking God to please forgive me. Do you think he heard my prayer or do I have to say a special type of prayer? Please help. Uh -huh. There's no different saying a prayer on account of uh, sex than it is on account of slandering somebody. So prayer is prayer, and God will forgive you all manner of sins and blasphemies. The thing that's going on, though, uh, you know, you love your boyfriend. I mean, the, the Apostle Paul is very clear about this. You know, it's better to marry than to burn with lust. And so, uh, you know, if you can't contain it, then... There's nothing wrong with getting married, but if he, if he's really sincere, this boyfriend of yours, and if he's a Christian, if he, the two of you have a unit, union in the Lord, that's fine. Otherwise, you know, break it off. It's just one of those things, you know, okay. Wise counsel. This is Pamela who says, is it necessary to be baptized to make it to heaven? My husband and I are recently saved and are getting conflicting answers from friends and family as to whether it's necessary or not. I believe we are saved by faith and baptism is a great way to acknowledge what Christ did for us on the cross, but is not a requirement for salvation. Well, the apostle Paul said, God didn't send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel. He said, yeah, I, I baptized a couple. Oh, yeah, there was somebody else. There was another one. But uh, other than that, my job was to preach the gospel. So if baptism was necessary, but the whole idea of baptism, I'm buried with baptism and raised in newness of life. And it is a breaking off of the old and the coming of the new. And so I, I think it's an important uh, step in the Christian life, is it necessary to get to heaven to be baptized? I don't think so. At least the, from what I read in the Bible, it's not there. But would it be important for you? Absolutely. You know, I was baptized in a Baptist church as a young fellow. I didn't know the Lord. I later came to the Lord, and I decided I would get baptized again. But I was baptized the next time because I wanted to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. And uh, you know, the Lord has done all that. But uh, I, I recommend it, but I don't think it's necessary to get to heaven, all right? This is Mandy who says, during the first coming of Jesus, if the dead in Christ shall rise, what does that mean? I thought to be absent in the body is to be present with the Lord. So how would they rise? Um, I, I think you've got the scriptures turned around. Uh, Jesus didn't say when he first came that the dead in Christ would rise. Uh, he came as a little baby. Uh, into Mary's womb, and he was 
you know, a young man, and he was the in his 30s, and then he was crucified, and he uh, he died. Then he rose from the dead. But when he comes back again, the dead in Christ will rise, and we who are, uh, remain will be called up to be with him in the air. The first will be those who know the Lord, and then those who are uh, you know expecting his coming. But um, I don't quite understand what your question is. Uh, it doesn't make sense to me. I think you've got the scriptures wrong. There's nothing that said when Jesus came the first time that the dead in Christ rose. Yeah, and I think she also wants to know what? when people die then, are we saying that they're asleep in their bodies as opposed to being present with the Lord? Well, the, the, the spirit, uh, the apostle Paul said, you know, I, if I'm at home with the bottom, I'm absent from the Lord, I'm you know, with the Lord. Mm -hmm. But it's in the spirit. It's not, not physically. Okay. It's coming back with him. So yeah. someone else, Brent, wants to know, what do you eat for breakfast? <laughs> well, uh, today I had a couple scrambled eggs, but uh, I, I usually I eat some oatmeal or uh, I don't eat a whole lot of anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're a blueberry guy, aren't you? Yeah, well, I, I have, but not at breakfast. I, but I, I have some of that uh, Ezekiel bread, and I have a piece ah. of that toast uh, occasionally, but. I don't eat a whole lot of anything anymore. <laughs> you know, I, my weight, I, when I was boxing at 15 years old, I weighed less now, for several pounds less than I weighed when I was 15. So that's probably a good thing. Well, today's power message is from Psalm 19. The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament shows His handiwork. Well, that's all the time we got. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.